Yes. Welcome to the uh, January uh, online viewing session. I'm going to get rid of this. This is driving me nuts. This is right in my way here. Um, I'm going to be, <laughs> you, you got the pleasure of uh, listening to me as the host. And uh, this is the first time I've done this. So this is the Shakedown Cruise. Um, I don't know how this is going to go, but uh, just think of it as not a presentation. I didn't even make these notes. Richard did. Um, but think of it as a we're we're in an we're in an observing session. So um, when it's time to talk, please talk because I don't want to be the only one talking here. Um, and just just think of uh, think of this as an informal gathering of observers looking at uh, various objects in the sky. I think we're going to have a good time. Um, so the first thing I want to do is uh, introduce you to the uh, the Pishi Observatory. Pishi, by the way, is is uh, Apache for um, for Nighthawk, and uh, so that's that's what the the, uh, the observatory is named after. Kind of like the um, it's kind of like the whoops it's it's kind of like the um, observatory that we have uh, in the the Owl Observatory. But you'll notice that there are two sets of uh, posts here on each side, not not one. So it's a bigger it's a bigger uh, uh, structure. Um, here's the tele, here's the Takahashi telescope, which is the small the smaller of the two. There's two two telescopes we'll be using tonight. They're both mounted on the uh, on the mount and uh, the German equatorial mount, and they are um, this is the smaller of the two. It's a four inch refractor. And uh, we usually start out the sessions using that, and then we'll later graduate to the larger 20-inch uh, uh, plane wave. Is it 20, 20 inches, Richard? 20 inches. 20 inches, OK. Um, over here, we see the weather station. And uh, according to reports there, uh, the weather is excellent for observing tonight, so that's good. Right here is the all-sky camera. And you can see um, that's, the, that's, the bird, that's where the birds go right there as opposed to on top of the all sky camera that's important because uh there's a there's a better picture of the all sky camera and um it, it gives it let's basically it just allows us to see the the entire sky um and and we can take a look at what it looks like right now i don't know if it's going to be dark enough to see a whole lot right now with that oh, yeah. camera okay can you do i have to stop sharing or what no, you can just uh, change your share. Okay. Well, I didn't do that. I just stopped sharing. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, change my share to... Okay. New share. So how do I do that? You just uh, pick something else. Okay, but I don't think I've got the... I don't have the on online uh i don't have the camera i guess i can get the camera hang on just a second um okay hang on bear with me do you want me to do it joe uh i, I get it just a second okay uh, okay Put telescope Oh, it's underneath underneath all this stuff here. There you go. A lot of stuff. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, good. Um, oh, yeah, we can see a lot of stuff here. Over here, this bright star here is not a star. That's Jupiter, and it's, it's setting. Um, but here you can see the constellation Orion, and it's, it's quite prominent. It's a lot... It's a lot more prominent than those constellations you were showing last month, Richard. Uh, this is, um, these are a lot brighter. And um, so here's Orion. Here is Taurus right here. This is the eye of Taurus Aldebaran, that, that star there. And um, here's the Hyades in Taurus. And uh, this is the, these are the Pleiades right here. And I'm not sure where the horns are, but maybe here or here. No, no, it's here and here. That's where the horns are. Okay, um, this over here is the star Sirius in the in the constellation Canis Major, and uh, I believe this is that's Procyon. I believe that's it. Okay, and these are the two. This is 
Castor and Pollux. Pol I'm sorry, Castor and Pollux. I think other I, way around. Other way around. Castor and Pollux. <laughs> okay. I think Castor is a good double star. Is that not? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a six tuplet system. Okay. And um, so that's kind of this is the constellation, the Charioteer uh, Auriga. Probably pronouncing that wrong. I might pronounce. I'm going to be pronouncing a lot of things wrong, but just bear with me. Um, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> and, Most of us, what were the difference, Jeff? Right. <laughs> and down here is a, a, a is a is a hare called Lepus, the hare. And there's a nice double star right there. I just looked at it the other night, and then I un unfroze my fingers um, after that. It was very cold. It was nine degrees. At any rate, so that's the all sky camera. Any any questions um, on what we're seeing here? Yeah, I was I was wondering. There's a couple of dark spots there. Is that anything? This right here, for example. Yes. I I think that's camera. Um, yeah. That's camera. Uh, that's just the camera. <laughs> just it's stuff inside the dome we can't get off unless we yeah. take it apart. You can see the Milky Way. At least this arm of the Milky Way right here. So that's pretty cool. Going right through the, the charioteer. Okay. Um, and of course, you can see the uh, the zodiacal light in the in the west there. That big that, shaft. Is that, is that what we're looking at here? That that's the zodiacal light, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Cool. I've never seen these zodiacal lights, so uh, this is new to me. What does that mean, zodiacal light? Traditionally, it, the zodiacal light is thought to be where the sunlight reflects off, uh, like comet and asteroid dust. But there's a new idea uh, brought about from the Juno spacecraft that says the source of the zodiacal light is actually dust from Mars. Hmm. So who knows? <laughs> okay. But it, it's most prominent in the springtime and the fall. But we're seeing it, we're having it, we're seeing it pretty nicely here. Okay. Um, why don't we go ahead and uh, move on to our first target then? Unless anybody has any other other thoughts on this, uh, so now I got to share my screen again, or share do a new share, or actually do this. Go back to power. Okay. Um, the first target is the telescope. <laughs> Let's talk about the telescope first. Uh, this is the Takahashi FSQ 160 EDX3. And it's got a lot of features. I won't go through all of them, but uh, basically, it's a four-inch telescope. It's got a it's got an aperture of 106 point. It's actually 4.17 inch or 4.17 inches, and the focal length is 530. Now, I I have a four-inch telescope in my garage right now, um, and it has an it has a focal length of uh, 1300. So it will see a lot farther. It'll see a lot not farther away. It'll see a lot. Um, It'll have a, it has a, a, a uh, um, it magnifies a lot more, but this is good. This telescope is good for doing wide field uh, images. And, you know, a lot of times I talk to people and they say, well, how, what's the, what power is your telescope? Well, a lot of times you want to see with a planet, you're going to want some, a lot of magnification, but with, with star, a lot of star, uh, you know, nebula and, and star clusters, and that sort of thing, you want a wider field, especially for some of the objects we're going to be seeing, like Orion's sword. And so, you know, it's nice to have a, a, an array, a, an arsenal of various uh, instruments, like binoculars, as well as teles you know, telescopes. So you get the wide field and also the narrow field. And, and, you know, visually just without anything, without, you know, any kind of optical aid, we get the widest field. And that's, that's important too. So just thought I'd bring that out. Um, just, oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, not, telescope's not very heavy. And it has a, gee whiz, I'm, this, the zoom thing keeps getting in my way here. <laughs> it's a heavy duty, a four inch rack and pinion focuser um, and uses that extra low dispersion glass. And that's, that's, it's got a lot of nice features uh, and they, a lot of them are mentioned up here, the, uh, which corrects for astigmatism and coma. Um, the coma is the, the thing that makes the property that makes stars look like uh, co uh, comets, <laughs> you know, they're not focused properly. 
Um, and then some other things with uh, spectral, uh, ad spherical aberration and spectral aberration, that sort of thing. So um, let's move on. And um, okay, this is the camera. I don't know a lot about cameras, uh, but this is the CCD camera that's on the top. This is on both of the telescopes too, I believe. I mean, yes. each one has one of these, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. So if you're into, into the photography end of it, which is actually what we're gonna be doing, um, this, is the, this is the camera that we're gonna be using. It does have uh, a old seven, a filter wheel that holds seven 50 millimeter filters. So that's interesting. Sometimes when you take color pictures, that sort of thing, you're gonna need all that. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. Cause I don't know, I don't know much about, about these cameras, um, but we can do the first object, which is this, whose name is blocked by my, uh, you are sharing your screen thing. Um, but it's, it's, I see, I better read my notes here. It's, I see, um, what does IC stand for? I wrote it down because I don't remember. It Index is... catalog. Thank you. <laughs> I wrote it down on this card. <laughs> Index catalog 2118. But uh, better known as the Witch Head Nebula. And here's a, 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 a sketch of the nebula, or, or a, maybe it's a computer generated sketch or something, but um, it shows the shape of what we're going to be looking at, what we're going to be taking a picture of. Um, basically, it's located in the constellation. Um, let me, God, I gotta move this thing over. This thing's driving me nuts. I'm gonna move it down there. That doesn't help. Um, at any rate, uh, it is in the constellation Her Eridanus, which is the river. And it's two point, there we go. There's, there's, a, there's a really wide field here. Um, this is Starry Night, I believe, this software that, that's running on this or that, that, that's showing this. It's not running right now, it's a picture, but yes. um, at any rate. It is uh, 2.6 degrees west of the blue supergiant uh, Rigel, star Rigel in Orion. That's a, it says, the notes say east, but isn't that west? Nope. I don't think so. Maybe you're right. Maybe it is west. Yeah, I think this is west. So I, yeah. I changed it. Sorry. Oh, well, I could have it. <laughs> there are new notes, so I got a typo in there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, uh, but it's west of the supergiant Rigel. This is a nice double to look at, too, if you want into in double stars. Um, Rigel is, that is. Okay, the true separation between Rigel and the Witch Nebula is 40 astronomical units. That's not much at all. So that would make the nebula about 50 light years long. Um, and we'll, there'll be a little, little bit more on, on the, the distance between the, the relative distance between Rigel and the Witch, and, and, you know, once we get the picture taken and everything. Um, it was discovered photographically by the German astronomer Max Wolf in 1909, and it's very difficult to observe visually because it's it's got a large size and a low surface brightness. Um, it can be seen in with seven by fifty or ten by fifty binoculars from really dark sites. Uh, I don't give it a prayer from my my uh, my driveway, um, but at any rate, um, the witch head was memorably used in the TV show Andromeda as the site of a major space battle that sent civilization into an era of chaos. So uh, just a little bit of trivia there. Um, any rate, to give you, a, I should have brought this up here. This is a closer view of, of where the Witch Head Nebula is relative to Rigel. And uh, this is this, what we're looking at here when we show these pictures, this is from the Pocket Sky Atlas, which I have one of these right here. They're, they're very nice to have. This is, I think this is from the bigger version of it, though. Um, I have the smaller version, and neither version fits in anybody's pocket, but they call it that anyway. Um, but at any rate, so let's, um, let's go ahead and uh, take a, well, let's, we're not taking a look at it, but let's, um, have you got it, have you got it on the, uh, have you got it yeah. running on the, on the thing, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Okay. First, let me show you the telescope live. Okay. So this is a live view of the remote telescope in the observatory, and it is now uh, pointed at the uh, the witch head. I don't see it. Uh, do I need to stop share? Maybe I do. Uh, let's just go ahead and hit it. I've okay. never tried to switch uh, shares from somebody else before, so here it is. Okay. So you should be able to see it now. We'll try it next time. <laughs> so this is a live view of the remote telescope in the observatory here. 
And of course, this is the 20 inch that we'll use later and you can barely see the Takahashi behind the mm -hmm. 20 inch. So this little thing is the one we're using now. And what, means... what kind of exposure time are we getting on this? Well, let's uh, 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 switch to that. All right, so you should be able to see my web browser here. So this is the program uh, ACP, which, is, which stands for the Astronomer's Control Panel. So ACP is a program that controls other programs. So ACP isn't directly controlling the telescope, but it controls the programs that control the telescopes and the cameras and stuff like that. And you can see I'm doing a 600 second exposure of the witch head, which is 10 minutes. We're about uh, halfway into it now. You can see we have a guide star, we're guiding. And it's, uh, it's coming along there. So that's where we're at right now. Okay. So I can keep an eye on it. We can stop sharing here. And of course, we can take questions or something, so. You guys, are all, you guys are all muted, so. Uh, <laughs> um. Is that is that considered a dark nebula? No, this is a actually a reflection nebula, and you'll see it. it, it it's not going to appear. It it appears blue in color images. We're seeing it in black and white, um, but it's actually a uh, it's produced from the its light is is, is reflected from the, the star Rigel, which which we saw we saw that uh, in the in the two uh, uh, pictures there before. So uh, in fact, I'll just go ahead and. Well, I'm not sharing the screen, so let me share the screen here. Maybe you mentioned this earlier and I missed it, but are you using any type of uh, filter on this? We are using a clear luminance filter. Okay. Yeah, this is it, it's reflecting off of the star Rigel, which is which is right here. When I do this, can you see that or or, or are people's? Uh... Yeah, we can see. Okay. It. <laughs> so I've got... I, I don't know what you're seeing. I don't know if you're seeing the, uh, the Zoom uh, pictures in the way or something, because they're in my way. You know what? I'm going to hide. I can hide that. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing it at this point. Well, maybe I'll keep it on there. Let's go back to this just for the sake of argument here. Um, it's a, okay. It's a magnitude 13 object. So you, you, the, your notes here say that it was. it's very hard to see. You can actually, can you actually see that with binoculars? That you, you can actually see that with binoculars. Then that's, that what, that's, that's what I've, that's what I've read. Right. I've never done it myself. But okay, yeah, that, I'm, I'm, that's, that's, uh, that's a pretty dark uh, object there. I'm, I'm I just, know. yeah, okay. <laughs> where's, uh, where's Mike Patton? Mike Patton, he, he, because he's live in the observatory right now. Go outside with binoculars and see if you can spot the witch head. <laughs> I can do it. He's got the lights on, though. He's gonna have. I can have any dark sky vision. That's right. He has to get dark adapted first. All right. We are four hundred and ten seconds into our exposure. Okay, we got another two hundred to go. Then is that bright star in the middle of the witch head up in the upper left quadrant? Is that hasn't that one? Does that have a name? Good question. Um. I don't know if it, 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 it probably does, but I don't know what it is. It probably has a designation. I don't know if it has a name. Yeah. Maybe I a just number. I wonder if it's like a guiding star or something for this nebula. Could be. <laughs> I see a nice galaxy down there towards the yeah. bottom, too. Yeah, it's a nice sketch. Yeah, I don't see oh, that yeah. on the. I don't see that on the uh, on on the uh, on the um, uh, what do you call this the pocket sky atlas. I don't see any any little. Uh, I see a double star underneath it. That's about it. Maybe that's part of the witch head nebula, or or is it? I don't know. <laughs> so is the galaxy the one in the lower part there? Yeah, it's a little streak, kind of a fuzzy blob. Oh, you talk. Oh, you talk about this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. I thought you, I thought you were referring to this. Uh, that does look like that is a, that does look like a galaxy. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe the maybe the, the when we get the image, it'll show it up even better. Also, oh, why is it black and white, or is that just why is it black and white? 
Why are we looking black and white at uh, 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 photographing black and white? I think it has right. something to do with the processing, you know, the time it would take to, to take a color picture and pro and maybe we'd have to process it and that sort of thing. Yeah. For, for serious deep sky imaging, you want to use a monochrome camera because they're higher resolution than color cameras. So, so yeah, our, our camera is monochrome and to take color images, color images, we have to take them through red, green, blue filters. And that just takes too much time. So all the images will be black and white, kind of what you see through a telescope. Uh, someone asked in the chat how you measure the magnitude of a star. Boy, I don't know. Um, do you, anybody anybody want to chime in like Richard? Well, <laughs> today, you know, of course, back when they originally started measuring magnitudes, you know, a couple thousand years ago, uh, they just basically put them in the rough groups you know, with the unaided eye. But today we measure it, you know, to high precision using photometers and digital cameras. And we basically, you know, we still, still consider it magnitude, you know, or most people think of it as the brightness, but, but there's also a term called flux involved, which is kind of the amount that uh, photons hit, like say one square meter and one, or one meter and uh, one second or something like that. So it, there, there, there's a, a defined, uh, you know, a definition of it, but you know, it's, it's done through uh, digital means by um, today. And then there's the problem with uh, like something that has a lot of, um, oh, here we go. That, that, that's not, that's not a star, not a point source. It's got, a, it's spread out like this is. That's a, that, that, that adds another dimension of uh, difficulty to the term magnitude. It could have, it could have a lot of, uh, it could have a, 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 a bright magnitude, but if it's spread out, that magnitude is, 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 is as it's spread out. So it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be as bright as something like a star of that same magnitude. All right. Is, right. is everyone ready? Yeah. Here's Here's yeah. our first image you, of the you night. Gotta, you gotta ooh and ah, so I you gotta unmute yourself and ooh and ah. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> do -do 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 -do. Ooh and ah. Oh, we got a satellite. Ooh. Oh, wow. oh ah. Ah. Yeah. Ooh. Didn't, get, ooh. Ooh. didn't get a satellite cool. there. That is yeah. satellite. Now is it is this like I, I gotta there it I gotta, is. is this the Yes? Okay, the, is that the galaxy you're talking about? That's the galaxy right there in the sketch, okay. yeah. Yeah, Robert said it's NGC seventeen fifty two. There you go. Okay. You well, can see anyways, Rigel uh, off screen here. This this is this is a reflection nebula, and it, it appears blue in color images. Uh, it, it, and it's from the star. The Rig, star Rigel is reflecting the light off dust particles in this in this in this uh, nebula, and um, the blue color indicates the dust particles uh, must be really small in order to preferentially scatter the shorter wavelengths, which is the, the blue photons. Um, they're thinking that this is this witch nebula might be an ancient supernova remnant. Um, and then they did, they've done radio observations and revealing that parts of this nebula, IC2118, which is the witch head nebula, shows significant carbon monoxide emissions um, indicating it contains molecular clouds where star formations occur. We're, we're, there's a lot of star formation that we're going to be looking at, in, uh, you know, today. Uh, and, and so, um, but carbon monoxide, I, I, it could be that the carbon monoxide is from the internal combustion engines used in that, 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 that battle, that space <laughs> battle in Andromeda. That's what I was thinking. That's, that's sort of a joke, maybe. But at any rate. <laughs> um, but at any rate, the stars in there are uh, candidates for pre-main sequence stars, um, very young stars, just beginning their lives. And now what are these, as well as some T Tauri stars embedded deep within the nebula? What are T Tauri stars? T Tauri stars is a phase that protostars go through early in their life. Okay. So very likely the sun was once a T Tauri star in its pre-main sequence days. Well, this thing, go ahead. I was going to say Mike responded in the chat that you have to use your imagination to see it in the binoculars. Well, he's not dark adapted either. <laughs> okay. Now, 
this is is this the hat of the witch down here and we're looking at we're looking at this upside down or is this the uh yeah the the, the face of the, the witch with the nose and no this is her she's right side up now this is her nose this is her chinny chin chin and she has like a big hat that goes off the screen here okay right okay <laughs> hello my pretties <laughs> she got nailed by a satellite though yep well it, 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 there's a ward on there hopefully it took it off but at any rate Okay, are we ready to move on to another target? Absolutely. And just remember, we can uh, we will allow you to d download the images probably tomorrow, and you can zoom in on the galaxy there and maybe see it a little closer. Because this is just and, a reduced version of the picture. And her earring, that bright earring. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, she has a bright earring. Too. Trying, to, trying to cover up a multitude of sins. All right, Joe, you can uh, Okay, let me go the, Talk about okay. the next target, and I'll get started. The next one is um, the Horsehead Nebula. Now, we're, we're, I think we're more familiar with the Horsehead Nebula, also known as B33. Um, so let's go to my sharing again. Maybe I am sharing. Yeah, I guess I am. Can you everybody see that? No. You're not no. Sure. no, you're not sure. I'm not sharing. Okay, let's, let's do this better. How about that? Well, we're getting yep. there. There you go. Okay. All right. So this is the Horsehead Nebula, and there's a few uh, facts and figures on the right ascension declination. It's a magnitude 7.3. Um, hard to see. I've never seen it, actually. Um, and it's 1.35 or 1, 1 point, 1,375 light years away. Um, let's go to here, and you'll see where it's located. Uh, the three belt stars in Orion. This is this is the larger view. Let's go to the next view here. Um, it's it's right in the region. You can see it here in the in the uh, pocket sky atlas. This is this is the where the nebula is appearing right here. Um, and the, of the three belt stars, it's in the it's in the, um, the the left the one on the left, the easternmost star, which is called um, Alnitek. Thank you. I'm glad you said that because. Uh, I have trouble with it. Also known as Zeta Orionis, and uh, so and that and that by the way is a is a it's, it's a it's one of the one of the double stars on the uh, Astro astronomical league's double star program. And I've been trying to trying to separate the the, the nearest of the of the two uh, less bright stars from that a few times and have not succeeded yet. But anyway, the nebula was first recorded on a photographic plate in 1888 by Scottish astronomer Williamina Fleming at Harvard College Observatory. Um, Edward Pickering, let me let me put a picture down here. Next one, come on. Okay, there's a pic. There's a picture of her. Um, I'm not sure which one is her. She's standing. She's the one standing. That's that's Williamina Fleming, and Edward Pickering claimed that his maid could do a better job of identifying and cataloging logging the observatory images. And so he hired his maid, who's uh, Fleming, and um, along with several other women who became known as computers. Now, if you ever saw the movie Hidden Figures, that's another, that's, a, that's an excellent movie. See it. Um, just, it was, came out in 2017. Also, they were also, those women were also known as computers. But that was that was in the 1960s. This is uh, in the you know uh, late 1800s. Yeah, late 1800s, I believe. Yeah, the thing yeah. on the loss is 1889. Okay, yeah, and uh, but at any rate, in addition to in addition to discovering the Horsehead Nebula, uh, Fleming also discovered 58 other gaseous nebulae, 10 novae, and more than 300 variable stars. Um, she became the first American woman to be elected an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society of London. Um, another fun fact, uh, photographing it in uh, 1894, E.E. E. Barnard described it as a dark mass uh, with a diameter of four minutes on nebulous strip extending south from Zeta Orionis. Um, so, but what, what we're looking at is actually a, a dark nebula um, within another nebula. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
What was her name again, Joe? Wilhelmina. Oh, her name. Her name is. It, I'll spell it. It's. I think it's. It's, it's Wilhelmina. It's spelled William with an I N I. I'm, I'm, Wilhelmina. I'm, yeah. Is it Wilhelmina? Yes. I was. I keep saying Williamina, but I'm thinking Wilhelmina. And her last name is Fleming. F L E M I N G. Thanks. I think I remember seeing this picture in Sky and Telescope. Yep. So what what kind of time are we uh, are we on the? Uh... All righty. Uh, go to the next slide there, Joe, and we'll. Oh. Well. Are oh, we okay, that slide. Yeah. Okay, so let me see if I can take away the zoom from That's you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if we can do that. Okay. Can you see ACP? Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, so there we go. So we're doing... Everybody a, everybody but me, I got to stop sharing. There, now I can see it. <laughs> this time we're doing a five-minute exposure with the uh, luminous filter. I thought about doing H-alpha, but it's a little noisy in H-alpha. It looks a little mm -hmm. more impressive with the luminous filter with all the bright stars around and stuff like that, so... And this time we couldn't get a guide star. I don't know why we can't get a guide star, but for some reason we couldn't get, get one. Yeah, I don't know what the magnification is on this, but you couldn't get something like even even Zeta or, or uh, you know, yeah, Zeta Orionis. You couldn't get that. It probably wasn't quite in, in the field. It should be in the field, but maybe it was too bright. I, there, there were stars in the guide camera image, but for some reason they didn't pick them. It was too noisy. Like I said, we, we just got a new auto guider and I haven't got it maybe quite fine tuned yet. Okay. Well, we're almost there. We can, uh, I think I still got the browser shared so we can, you can check the all sky camera here and everything looks, uh, still looks pretty good. I don't see any meteors though, unfortunately. So we're looking, we're looking right about here. Can you see both, can you see both these uh, mouse arrows? Uh, I don't think we can see yours, but yeah, the Orion, okay. all uh, right. the, the, the horse head is hanging off the, uh, on the tech here, which is Zeta Orionis. So it's like right about there. Yeah. And now I can't, uh, hang on, we'll just un unshare there. Because again, yeah, for me, the zoom control is getting in the way again, and I can't switch back to the other tab. But we're almost done there. So let's go ahead and go back to ACP. Yeah, we're just about there. So, say goodbye to the witch head. <laughs> I know we need like a... just threw water on the witch. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. There we go. The, the thumbnail has loaded, but it takes a second for the actual, the big picture to load. So it'll, it'll bonk here a couple of times and then it'll be ready. Okay. While you're, well, there yeah, we go. I was say. all right. Are we ready? Yeah. Drum roll. Okay. Here we go. Ah, that's really nice. cool. Oh, wow. Nice job. There's the horse head right, right there. Which I don't think you can see my mouse, my mouse thing, or my cursor. Yeah. <laughs> and the flame right below it. That's the flame. Yeah. And this is uh, Zeta right there. And that's What's a kitty it? cat. Yeah. <laughs> kitty cat um, proves too. No, the, yeah, we 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 don't have a cat nebula on the on this on on the docket, but we do have a bat nebula coming up. Okay. Um. But the 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 Dark Nebula is actually the, the horse head part of this, if I'm not mistaken. And then the, um, um, and oh, by the way, the uh, it's it's about 3.2 light years tall by Richard's math. It must be right then, right? Uh, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's part of the much larger Orion molecular cloud complex, which is composed of two giant molecular clouds. Can we see both of those clouds here? Oh, they're huge. They're, they're, they're huge. B bigger huge. than this. Okay. Bigger. Um, <laughs> Orion, Orion A and Orion B are the two molecular uh, clouds. And and, uh, and well, the horse head is part of the Orion B complex. Um, it's a background emission nebula. Um, or the, I'm sorry, the background emission nebula is IC434. 
uh, discovered in 1786 by William Herschel and illuminated by Sigma or Orionis. And yeah, okay. So, uh, which is, which is, uh, wait, hold it. Where is Sigma Orionis? Can we point not, that out? I'm, I'm not sure if it's this one or this one. Okay, it's, all right. I'll guess it's I, the bright one. But you I know, know what, maybe I should, uh, that, was, that was actually a question for not you, but for me. Uh, that should be, well, I don't know if I can answer that. I'm, would you say it was? I think if I had to guess, it'd be the bright one, but I'm not really 100% okay. sure. Okay, all right. And I'm not sure either. Okay, I was going to look that up, but I, I didn't have time. Um, anyway, it's, a, it's an emission and reflection nebula, uh, or, or the emission and reflection nebula, which is called NGC 2023, which is located to the horse head's lower left. Lower that would be left. here. Okay. Okay. That is um, also discovered by William Herschel, uh, January 6, 1785. He discovered a lot of stuff. Um, NGC uh, 2023 is illuminated by HD 37903, that star, which has a spectral class of about B2, VE. What is VE? It's a special type of main sequence star. I forget exactly what the E stands for, but okay. five means it's a main sequence star. Oh, it's five. Okay, I said VE. Five E. Sorry. Roman numeral five E. <laughs> Roman numeral five E. <laughs> Okay, shows you how much I know. Uh, outside of the field of view is NGC 2024. Well, we can see the flame nebula, right? Yeah. So we get two for the price of one. Oh, here. that, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That part of the notes is for when we look at it with the plane wave. <laughs> uh -huh, okay, well, that's okay. This is, that's even, this is even better. Um, and it's, it's another emission nebula as opposed to a reflection nebula. Um, so I believe as an emission nebula, you're getting light from a, from a star and it's uh, causing light of a different wavelength, the lower wavelength from the from that nebula. Is that is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. As opposed to it just reflecting the same light. Okay. That's that's just a that's a sight to behold. Now somebody had a question about can we go back when, when we when we go back to the when we do the next one before we do that I'm going to go back to the. Um, the star chart so you can see where it is. I think someone had a question about it. I, we looked at it too closely. So we'll, we'll do that when we're, when we're done ooing and eyeing on this one. All right. Um, do we know a, why? Go ahead. Do we know why it was named Horsehead? Because the, 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 the dark nebula, um, which, which is, I can't point it out, but can you point that out again, please, yep. Richard? Okay, that dark nebula that you're looking at uh -huh. When you look at it closer, it looks like a horse head. If you, you can kind of see the, the horse head, with, it's kind of pointing its head down. or it's, it's no, yeah, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's, it's, The horse is actually oriented correctly in this, in this drawing, or in this, this picture, I mean. It's not a drawing. Um, and you can see other, this is other, other dark nebula right there where your arrow is. Right? Over, over here? Oh, I'm sorry. That's where my arrow is. Oh, <laughs> below that, <laughs> below that, in the in the in the uh, um, uh, the flame. Uh, in the the, yeah, the there's a dark nebula. Yeah, that divides the flame in two. Makes yeah. it look it makes it look flamey. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Wow, this is this is a sight to behold. At any rate, um, are you guys ready for another one? Looks like the night on a chessboard. <laughs> yes, exactly. I see we got another chess player in there. Righty. Okay, so I'm going to go back and um, let's see. Let's go back to my share the screen thing here. Trying to share the screen. Why am I not sharing the screen? Share it. Okay, I didn't think I had to do that. Okay, so let's just go back here. Um, and someone had a question as to where exactly it's located. Does this... Does this help? Uh, you know, does, it, does this help answer that question? I, I hope it does. Is this the flaming? Uh, What's it called? The flaming star nebula. Yes, that that little square would be the flame would be nebula, the flame. right? Or the flame nebula, flaming star. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on then. Um, the next target is Orion's sword. This is. This is this whole thing right here. And 
So it's it's not just one nebula or anything like that. It's 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 just a it's a wide field of the sword in Orion. In fact, in the pocket sky atlas, they actually have a a blow up of that that uh, that whole area in one of the in the appendix. And uh, so, if you want want to if you have one of those, it, it, it'll it'll help. Is that um, the Great Orion Nebula you're talking about, or that's in here? That the M M M forty. Can you see my arrow? Yeah. Okay. M forty two is right here. M forty three is right here. So that's that's that's. But but we're going to be looking at this whole sword area. So it includes those nebulae. <laughs> So I'm not really sure what this means as magnitude here, because there's going to be a lot of different magnitudes in here, um, or this this distance must be an approximate thing. Um, but at any rate, I'm not even reading my notes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, now I don't, uh, Richard. You're going to have to. It says not known to pre-telescopic observers. Why? Why is? Do you know why that would be? You're on mute, Richard. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm on mute there. Uh, yeah, there's no um, pre-telescopic records of anyone ever seeing the Orion Nebula, which is quite surprising because yeah, it is would, visible to the naked eye. I would think so, yeah. But there's no there's no written record of it or, or anything like that. So that, I guess that, that's, what, that's what's meant by that. I was first discovered by the French astronomer Nicolas... Uh, Claude Fabri de, he's got a long name here, <laughs> Nicolas Claude Fabri de Pierres, Pierres on November 26, 1610. Telescope was made in 1609, correct? Uh, a little earlier, but yeah, the, the Galilean telescope was made. Yeah, Galilean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, first published observation by a Swiss Jesu Jesuit astronomer and mathematician, Johann Baptiste Seizet, in 1619. Um, he compared it to a bright comet discovered in 1618. And um, yeah, okay. Uh, first published sketch was made by Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens in 1659. Um, Charles Messier observed it on March 4th, 1769. Um, I guess that, well, there, it, it includes Messier 42 and Messier 43. And I don't know if there's any other Messier objects in that. No, I don't think so. Oh, that's a star cluster. Well, that's a star cluster, though. Yeah, I, don't th I think those are the two. Okay. Um, it's the first ever instance of astrophotography of the, of, of the nebula, or the, I'm sorry, the first time that it was, it was, asked, it was pho photographed, actually, of any nebula, goes to the American doctor, amateur astronomer, and astrophotography pioneer Henry Draper. He used an 11 inch refractor to make a 51 minute exposure of the nebula on September 30th, 1880. We're not gonna do a 51 minute exposure. We've got better equipment. We're gonna do a 49 minute exposure. Um, so we're gonna have to sing 100 bottles of beer on the wall until- Actually uh, doing a three minute shot. So it'll go really oh, fast. Okay, that's, that's, <laughs> a, real, that's a relief. <laughs> By the way, this this is this represents uh, the closest uh, region of massive star formation to the Earth. We'll talk more about that. So, um, but yeah, this is this is a really really neat area to look at. Look at it with binoculars. It, it's it's just uh, especially mounted binoculars. You'd be able to see a lot of this stuff that we're looking at here. It's good to look at things with different fields of view because you get different perspectives on and you see different things. I was, I was, um, I was blessed with a pair of uh, 2.1, um, trying to think of the, the aperture, I think it's 2.1 by 42 in by 42 binoculars. And what good is that? Those are like opera glasses. Well, I'll tell you, you can see constellations. It really brings out constellations, especially from, you know, where, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't live underneath a, um, it's not like I've got so much light pollution that I'm like a, uh, I'm in a car, used car lot, but, uh, but it, it's, you know, it's not, it's not great. 
it, it's okay, but I can see constellations a lot better. I can see stars that I can't see with, but but it's still like I've got a very wide field of view, so it's almost like I'm looking with my just my regular eyes. So all these different fields of view are, are, are good to have. And did you say mounted binoculars or did you say mountain binoculars? Well, both. <laughs> yeah, if you could take them up to the mountain, that would be good too. But I said mounted. So okay. it, that means if you can, if you can hold them stationary, you, you, you get, you get a better, better view of things. Uh-huh. Joe, you want to move on to the uh, positions in the oh, sky? Oh yeah, sorry, I, I, got, I got, I got, I got lost. Um, here's, here's where Orion's sword is. Sorry, <laughs> thanks. Keep me honest here. Uh, this, this is the big, big picture here. Let me get blow up the little picture or the, the bigger picture. Um, so here's where the Orion sword is, and um, that we're going to be taking a picture of this whole area in here. Uh, we were over here with the Horsehead Nebula. Now we're down here. Um, so. And lots of lots of stars to look at here. And this is an even more close-up version. Like I said, the, the the pocket sky atlas has a has an appendix which has um, has the the sword of Orion in it. And uh, here's the um, what do you call that? The tetrad, the, the trapezium. The trapezium, trapezium, right? Yeah. And uh, so what's the 1981? That's an open cluster. That refers to the designation NGC, NGC 1981. Yeah. It just doesn't look that dense, that's all. Okay, how are we doing time-wise? We're done, it's done. We're waiting oh, for you. All right, oh, wait for me. okay, sorry. <laughs> that's fine, this one went quick. Some go, yeah. some go long, some, some go quick. All right, is everyone ready? Yes. We're here, ready. Here we go. This is a three minute shot, so it's a little <laughs> overblown, but I, I wanted to show the surrounding area a bit. There we go. Ooh, ah, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Fabulous. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can see M42 and M43. They would be this this area. This is 42 and 43. And correct yep. me if I'm wrong. Anybody. This is 42. And remember, 42. I was talking about the trapezium. Oh, wait, this is this is 43. Where's 43? The little head. The That's head 43. OK, OK. Um, and remember, I was talking about the trapezium. Forget it. You're not it's it's overwhelmed with brightness there. We got time. We can do uh, like a 60 second shot, too, although that'll probably be a little long, too. But or maybe yeah. we can even try a 30 second shot. We'll do a really short one. Yeah, but um, but I mean, th this is an area of that, that M42 is actually an area of, uh, uh, of, of young stars forming. Uh, it's 24, M42 is 24 light years across, has an estimated mass of approximately 2,000 times that of the sun. Um, an extremely young cluster, only 30,000 to 1 million years old of about 300 stars emerging from that M42. Um, M43, which is right below it in this picture, is part of the Orion Nebula, um, which surrounds Bond's star. And MGC 1980, where's MGC 1980? Is that, is that, can we see that in this picture? Uh, I forget it's where the, that is. Okay. It's down below. That, yeah, I think yeah. so. Somewhere. Is, is it is it the okay okay it's it's known as the lost jewel of Orion. It was discovered by William Herschel in January thirty first, seventeen eighty six, and NGC nineteen eighty one. Don't see that on my chart. I see nineteen eighty. Oh, I saw oh, nineteen eighty one is is um. That's I think, the big star cluster at the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so that's the big star cluster at the bottom, and that's at the northernmost part of Orion's sword, which looks at the bottom of Orion's sword in this picture because it's upside down. Um, that's a loose gathering of 20 or so stars spread across an area of sky comparable to the full moon, which would be half a degree. Um, NGC 1981 measures 11 light years across. So that's the that's these stars uh, right below the cloud, right? Uh-huh. Okay. So it's up, down in this picture? No, yeah. north, north is at the bottom, right? And that's just because of the way the telescope is oriented and on the mount. 
Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's 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 pretty cool. Any uh, that that's the um, you did you want to try a quick picture? Yeah, let's do a really short one. Okay, sure. All right, so I already got M42 in there. Let's go to, what do you want to do? 30 seconds to try to get the trapezium? Yeah. All righty, make, make it really short. Then I think we're moving on to the plane wave telescope. Yeah. So is the brightness of the nebula washing it out? Is that what it's doing in trapezium? Yes, it's, yeah, the Orion Nebula is quite bright. So when you image this, you take a whole range of exposures and try to do a high di uh, dynamic range image, which is what we'll show you here shortly. Is that an emission nebula? or a It's an emission nebula, right. The nearest big one to Earth. If you haven't seen it in a telescope through the eyepiece, definitely see it. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Right there. And you can, as you can see, we get lots of geostationary satellites. Th th that's what these are here. They're a real pain when you're trying to take pictures around here. Really? Okay. So are those, are those making the lines there? I mean, yeah, that's they're, they're geostationary, but... But Earth is rotating and then the st satellites are stationary, so they streak. Mm -hmm. Well, wouldn't they, wouldn't they be, wouldn't they be uh, theoretically stationary relative to the stars as well? Oh, yeah, well, you no, would think no. so, but no, not really. <laughs> yeah, they, I guess, I guess not. Yeah. Um, no, they would not. No. Okay, they would be stationary. No, they would. They wouldn't be stationary. They would be making a streak because they're closer. They're, they're, they're stationary. Oh, 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 oh. Well, they we they're stationary aren't. relative to the Earth. So yeah, they're gonna they're gonna make streaks. <laughs> All right. Yeah, they're so, they're counter stationary. They're going the other way. Yes. Even though it's uh, 30 seconds, it still has to look for a uh, guide star, but I think we're, we're, we're getting there. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. All right, so give it a second to <laughs> load. Blow up. It still looks pretty blown. Cameras are just so sensitive. Yeah, that does, that does look pretty bright. Can you say that again? What you said, trapezium? Trapezium, yeah, and they're they're hard to get, <laughs> especially with the smaller scope. Yeah, it's it's washed out. It's a group of very bright stars. I think they're they're very young, aren't they, Richard? Yeah, they're the uh, trapezium are easily less than a million, and they're all type O, which is the hottest of the hot stars. They're very very powerful stars. Isn't Rigel also a type O? No, a it's, typo, it's, it's a, a type O. It's a type B star. Okay. Somebody had asked uh, to explain the timing of exposures and what that means. Uh, and it's just how long you're leaving in the, camera to, the camera's aperture open and collect light. So the longer the exposure, the more light you're going to get. Right. But something like this, we're getting too much light to see the individual stars that are yep. in there. So speaking of which, uh, let me stop sharing here. Uh, Joe, do you want to show the next uh, couple of slides? We can show an, a an actual color image from the telescope. No, that's right. We have those. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, I got to show off, you know. Right. Okay. So I'm sharing. Okay. Okay. I guess that's where we need to go. Yeah. That is also the Orion. Oh, you got to back up. You got to back up. Back up, back up, back up. <laughs> you went too far. Oh, okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. There we go. We got Orion. Um, well, is it, what are we looking at here? This is the Orion and Running Man Nebula. Okay, so this is is this is the still the sword area. Yes, right? it's, it's, and, it's uh, basically you know normally we don't show color images like this because all our images are grayscale, but the only exception is when they are taken with the remote telescope. So this was taken with the exact same telescope and camera we just did live. Uh, but this is a concentrated series of exposures. So it, it covers the ex same exact field because it's the same telescope. And you can see I uh, took this over the course of roughly uh, four nights or so because you, you invest a lot of time in these targets today. And uh, so I did 28 30-second shots with the luminance filter. 
15 five minute shots and 16 10 minute shots all with the luminance and then i did uh 15 times 10 minutes each for the red green blue filters and created this high dynamic range image here using uh pig sensite but i had some help uh from kas member pete mumbauer uh getting this processed we That's did this cool. yeah we, we we did this during a pig sensite workshop uh, like a year ago that you can go back and watch on YouTube and see and see how we process this. Richard, what about uh, flats and bias? Um, yes. Yes. There's, there's, there's uh, darks, flats and biases all involved with this. Okay. Uh, you do you know tell, how many you took? Uh, normally I do at least uh, 50 of each. Okay. And you'll notice uh, the stars are really sharp down here, but they're a little puffy up here. That's because eventually we need to get the Takahashi in to get it collimated. Because uh, it, it was uncollimated when we got it. We just really haven't had a chance to work on that yet, even though it's been several years. But um, as soon as we wrap up, wrap up the uh, season here, we're probably going to try to send the Takahashi in to get uh, collimated. Because it does need a little work. And Joe, you can skip to the next one and show us the uh, close-up. It's a little closer. Mm-hmm. So this isn't quite the full resolution, but I wanted to crop it a bit and show the uh, image here. So normally when you see structure like this, you think it's with a, you know, a hydrogen alpha filter, which we really won't use tonight, I don't think. And uh, we'll use it on one target, but uh, this really shows again, you know, just how incredible this region is. So we have M42 here, yeah. M43 here, correct? Yes. And then this is the, the jewel down yep. here and do we what is this that's the running man nebula ah okay i was going to ask about that yeah okay that's impressive it's a beautiful picture mm -hmm. okay all right so what let me i'll go ahead and uh, switch telescopes and you can uh i'm to remind this. you to change the focal length ah thank you <laughs> oh <laughs> let me do <laughs> i'm gonna remember <laughs> let me do that first um, so now we're going to go to the uh, plane wave um, CDK-20 telescope. Um, it's got, uh, I'll just read, I'll just read through this. Um, I'll read through some of it. Um, ellipsoidal primary and spherical secondary mirrors with lens, with lens group. I'm not sure what that's all about. Um, but it's coma free, no astigmatism and a flat field across the 52 millimeter plane. Maybe that's why they call it a plane wave. At any rate, um, the optical specification, it's, it's got a 20, in, it's 20 inches, uh, it's got a focal length of 3,454 millimeters, so it's F ratio, which is the focal length divided by the, the aperture in millimeters, is 6.8. Um, weighs 140 pounds, and the primary mirror is a quartz, uh, so that, we got the more expensive mirror, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Excellent, excellent piece of equipment. And this just shows the, what does it show? I'm sharing. The camera. What's that? The camera, but I can't see it because the I can't see what it says on the top here. Okay, there's the, there's the imaging train. So it just shows how the camera is and there's the filter wheel there. Okay, and this has to do with the, man. That mount, I guess. Oh, this is the mount, and boy, holds 100, 240 pounds. 400 or oh no, wait. What does this mean? What's the difference between 240 pounds and 480 pound pole? 240 pack? instrument weight and 400 uh, 480 with, pound totals with with, with the counterweights. With the counterweights. Okay, that, okay, that makes sense. I think All we're right. actually exceeding that with counterweights, though. So we're we're probably in trouble there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of counterweights on it. When There's it's a lot of counterweights on it. Okay. Um, so um, this thing's in my way again. Wow. Okay. So tracker slew up to three hours past the meridian. So that does that mean if you if your if your counterweights are, are higher up than the uh, than the telescope? Is that what that's saying? Right. ACP never lets that happen though. It's very. Oh, okay. It's, it's so it doesn't strict. matter. It doesn't yeah. matter for this. Nope. Okay. Anyway, let's move on um, to the next target, which is the cosmic bat. Um, so, cosmic bat is also known as NGC 1788. It's a reflection nebula, not an emission nebula, but a reflection nebula. 
um, or it's also known as the Fox Space Nebula, discovered by guess who, William Herschel, on February first, seventeen eighty six. His uh, his sister, what was his sister's name? Caroline. Caroline. She she did a lot of the work too. I mean, she <laughs> it wasn't just him. They were a team. Anyway, found above the northeastern border of the constellation Eridanus. Eridanus. I know. Er Mike, 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 go ahead. Eridan Eridanus. Eridanus. <laughs> it's the river. About um, one and a half degrees north northwest of the third star, third magnitude star Beta er Eridani. Eridani. Contain. Who comes up with these names? Contained in a keystone of one. Okay, contained in a keystone of one tenth and three ninth magnitude stars. Uh, the brightest area surrounds two tenth magnitude stars aligned approximately east to west and a wide north-south pair of 12th magnitude stars between them. I should be pointing these out, but I'm not. Um, it's flanked due west by dark nebula Linz. Is that this thing right here? Mm -hmm. uh, or Linz or LDN 1616, which is likely a, a part of the of NGC 1788, a part of this bat nebula. The true physical size, this is about three light years is calculated by some guy named R. Bell. R. Bell. I wonder if he's related to Richard. I don't, I don't know. Um, so that's interesting. And it's at a distance. I guess I just read that. Distance of 1,300 light years away. I don't remember if I read that or not. At any rate, here's, here's where it is. It's, it's over here, uh, again, close to Orion, but in the constellation Eridanus, the river. And let's pull this up here. Okay, so 1788 is right there above the star beta, Cursa. That's all I got. Are we doing, um, are, are, are we ready with the telescope? Are we starting with the... Um... It just started the exposure. So we can, okay. uh, let me switch to the ACP screen here. Okay. So you can see we're just starting a 10, uh, 10 minute exposure because it's kind of faint. I tried some test pictures last night and I, I like the 10 minute one as opposed to the five minute one. So I figured I'd do a 10 minute one. So we got lots of time. Yeah, we got plenty of time. Someone was wondering uh, if M42 and M43 are part of the same structure or if they just look like they're near each other. They are. In fact, pretty much all the nebula that we're looking at around Orion, they are part of the same massive Orion molecular cloud. So they're all related. It's a huge region. Is it dark nebula or dust dust lanes that separate them that just they, they really if they weren't for that they we'd see them together? Yeah, if it weren't for uh, a bright nebulae in the background or a dense star field, you would you you wouldn't even know a dark nebula is there. Because they're because they're dark like space. Yeah. <laughs> Are you including the witch and the bat with that? Oh, I, with I, the, the big star cloud. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. I don't know the answer, so I, I didn't quite get the whole question. Are you including the witch nebula and this uh, cosmic bat as part of the Orion nebula? All are associated. Yeah, you know, the, the witch is technically in the constellation called Iridanus, but they're still part of the same complex. Well, the, the witch head would be a little closer to us. It's probably a little closer to us, though. But they're all related. Mm -hmm. Like, Rigel came from, you know, the Orion molecular cloud. So they're all young. Yeah, all, all many of these stars that we're looking at are very young. Let me... um. Let's check in and see what the telescope uh, looks like. We haven't showed the telescope in a while. I think I think the screen's gone black though. Oh no, there it is. Okay. So there's the uh, scope. You can see we're looking kind of high. Yeah. And now we are using the big scope. You can see the little shutter, the little cover on the Takahashi is closed now. So we put the Takahashi to bed. It did a good job. And now we're using the the big boy there. And you can see this is our flat screen here. We what we use to do flat fields. 
and you can see our club logo there. We have one just like this in the observatory here in town too. Thanks to uh, Rick Benno who lives out there in Arizona, right near Mike. In fact, when it's really windy out there, if you spit, you could, you could hit him. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we would want to do that. Rick's a good guy. While we're waiting, I'm just wondering if anybody's done any, uh, any uh, uh, stargazing lately. We'd had a couple of clear nights this week. They were dang cold. Well, I'll, stop. <laughs> I'll stop sharing there. Minus 38 here at, at night lately. A little cold. Where 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 are you? In Quebec. Oh, oh. man. That makes <laughs> that makes the nine that I had here sound like a spring day. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been brutal. <laughs> well, I, I'm I do I'm I'm working on some uh a, a astronomical league uh, observation program and i was doing a i did three log three of the double stars and uh by the time i and i, I took breaks i went inside and took took little breaks because I, I had you know for w one reason or another but my hand my right hand and i had the glove on but i had to take it off a lot to just just draw a couple dots and make a few observations write down a few things holy smoke that thing my hand started hurting when it thawed out it was just it was cold <laughs> there must be a better way to write things down without freezing to death in this kind of weather yeah i gotta say as an imager you know someone who likes to take pictures i think do, now do i want to take my telescope out and freeze to death or do i want to just use the remote telescope so i usually use the remote telescope these days so i <laughs> so i so i kind of wimp out well, the, it, it, there's there's the excuse of clouds, uh, or not. It's not an excuse, but clouds usually rule the rule the night, and so there aren't that many. It hasn't been a. It hasn't been a. Uh, there's been a lot of opportunities for it. Well, here the colder it is, the less cloud cover and less turbulence you get. Mm -hmm. They're actually better skies. Yeah. <laughs> so cold. <laughs> yeah. You say minus 38? Yeah. Wow. And actually, quite lucky because just a little north from here, they had minus 43. Oh, when it gets that low, you can't even tell. Well, no, Celsius? I mean, at minus Celsius, 40. yeah. Now, the good thing about minus 40, you can just minus say minus 40, 40 and it doesn't make any difference which one it is. No, the exactly. They meet it <laughs> at minus 40. So it's. <laughs> But it's been warmer now. Today was minus 13, yesterday minus 17, so it's going up. Now, just remember, <laughs> if your tauntaun dies, just cut it open and crawl inside and you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whose lightsaber will she borrow? Yeah, you got to borrow a lightsaber, too. Should always have one handy in your emergency kit. Yeah, here's somebody who has a good idea. Use a voice recorder on your smartphone to record notes. There you go. Uh, let's see now. On my smartphone, we open up the communicator. And, uh, you know, this one actually might have something like that. Problem yeah, is, you I, can't. I got to draw two dots, so. I you can't understand that. yourself over the, your, your chattering teeth, though. So that's, that doesn't work either. <laughs> Let's figure out how to draw with voice, and it's just it's and with double stars, it's just you know a couple dots, it's maybe two dots. Ones. It's it's not that bad. It's not that that it's not that labor intensive. So we are a little over four hundred seconds into a six hundred second exposure, so we're okay. getting there. Ooh. We're moving. We're moving along. I did wimpy uh, observing today. That is. I looked, used the PST solar scope, club solar scope, and went outside and looked at the sun for about two hours and got about five minutes worth of uh, looking because it was cloudy. But uh, we do have a couple of sunspots. Didn't see many prominences though. Wow. It, it you know it got it got kind of windy today too a little at least when we were around I think. One o'clock, I think it started getting windy. So hopefully you run out then. So I, I just mentioned that 
to let everybody know I do have the PST in case anybody <laughs> needs it. You got to be a member, though. You should have that. Now. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Is he a member? We better check his membership card. <laughs> He told me he allegedly renewed, but he's the treasurer, so you can't trust him. <laughs> That's right. I'm in control of the cl- keys that click paid and not paid. You're, hey, you're, 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 you're in comtroll. You're the comtroller. <laughs> Speaking of freezing, the February freeze out's next Saturday. Yeah. Well, it's scheduled. <laughs> it's scheduled, yeah. <laughs> actually went to it once oh let me here let me share the observatory computer too i showed this while we were focusing but this is a screen of the computer in the observatory that um you know has all the programs that uh connected and controls controls the telescope so over on the right here we have acp so again this is the program that controls like this program here called maxim dl maxim dl is what controls the main camera and the auto guider and then I'll, I'll I'll pop it up here real quick. This is the sky, which controls the mount. But Richard, ACP uh, controls the sky. Richard, how long has that computer been running continuously? Uh, pretty much since October, but we shut it down a couple of times. We had trouble earlier this week because probably because of the all sky camera um, mm-hmm. run, r- running all the time and taking like a picture every four minutes. The, the, um, the fragmentation gets pretty high and the computer oh, runs really right. slow and that was causing troubles, but I, I have it to where it optimizes every day now and it seems to be better now. That, now you can control that from where you are, right? I mean, yeah, I'm right? using, I'm using a program called any desk to connect to the computer in the observatory. Cause of course I'm in Kalamazoo and the computer here is in right. Arizona. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, my point was that uh, Mike didn't have to do it. No. Yeah. All right. Well, we're almost done there. So we'll switch back to the ACP screen here. So how cold is it in Arizona? Uh, let's hop. Let, let me, I'll just tell you uh, the uh, temperature says 50, uh, 44.4 degrees. Nice. Nice. <laughs> t-shirt weather. Yeah. Well, yeah. 50. Now it's, yeah. Okay. I got 47 at uh, whatever this is. I think this is just portal. But you got you got the weather right there. Um, I got another freaking satellite. Jeez. Mm-hmm. Looks like it's rotating too, but that just might be because of the side. Are, are we ready? Yeah. Who get ready to remember to be impressed? It's kind of of scary looking. (laughs) Whoa, look at that. Ah, Nice. That doesn't look like a baseball bat. (laughs) Oh, it's the dark nebula inside. That's kind of that's kind of like a little cigar. Yeah, Yeah, there is a satellite line going through there. But um, at any rate, this is sharp. Yeah. The, this, the notes here say the distribution of stars in the universe can't be fully explained if the stars only form in large conglomeration of star clusters, such as those in the Orion Nebula, which is M42. Um, the effect, effective star formation in isolated molecular clouds, far from massive complexes, but most likely induced by them, offers an explanation for the observed distribution of stars. And this is one. This is one such isolated cloud. This N, this is NGC seventeen eighty eight, also the, known as the cosmic bat. Um, and stars within it have an average age of one million years, and these are known as preschool stars. And they fall into three classes. Uh, the more senior stars lie east of the long wing. Okay, I guess we should. Um, I don't have the pointer. Uh, do, I'm not sure which way east and west is, but and, and what what where are the wings? I, I, where's the, well? There's kind uh, of a wing. There's kind of a wing here. I think that's that's what I think mm-hmm. people are seeing. How does this mm-hmm. look like a bat? I guess that's what I'm asking. <laughs> are those the two eyes of the bat? Uh, I guess you can mm-hmm. say that. Okay, it almost looks like it almost looks like the bat the bat's coming head on at us or something. Okay, but at any rate, there's uh, the, the one in one. Um, in the long wing, which I think is the wing on the right side, 
of the picture. Um, those are where the more senior stars are, and the moderately young stars make up the small cluster enclosed in the main nebula, which they illuminate. Um, the youngest stars, that's the moderately young stars, the youngest stars still embedded in dusty cocoons lie farther to the west. Don't know which is west on this. Could be over here, say in this region here. Okay, okay. So all right. Looks pretty yeah. quiet over here. Yeah. Okay. I think the east is to the to the left of the picture there. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say because the the uh, on axis guider uh, flips the image too. So this is actually a mirror image of the way the telescope would normally see it. So right. I have to figure it out. When yeah. I send you the when I have the Im images available for download. I try to correct the uh, orientation if I remember to do it. <laughs> is there a special is there a special name for that? It looks like there's a dark nebula in inside on, above those two stars. Is there? A well, I think I, that? that's supposed to be the bat. I think that's that's yeah. what I thought. Oh, that is. Yeah, the, I think so. Yeah, there's like a wing here and a, and a wing here. Oh, okay. I was thinking it was the wider nebulosity that we're seeing. <laughs> that's what yeah. I thought. Yeah. But you know the, the crab nebula doesn't look like a crab to me. So what, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Somebody's got a real imagination. It's a maybe there's a maybe there's a psychological. Um, we can do psychological tests with with how uh, how what what people think these look like, like a like a the blot test, only this the nebula the nebula test. This is the first time we've done this during an online session. By the way, the the witch head and this. And our last target are all first tonight. We haven't done these before. We haven't done the Rosette Nebula. Oh, the Rosette Nebula is the next one, but there's another one after that. That's next. Yep. So let's. Okay. I, so I think we're. I think we're done with the bat, right? Okay. Let's go to the Rosette, which is uh, two, 2244. And let me get the thing here so we can see the. Okay. Here's. The, oops. Let's do this. Okay. NGC two twenty four two two two. 2244 is the Rosette Nebula. Um, gives you the, the stellar cor celestial coordinates. Magnitude 4.8, but it's it's diffuse, so uh, this might this might not appear that bright. <laughs> um, 5200 light years away, and this shows where it is. It's in the constellation Monoceros. Monoceros. Mon sounds like a rhinoceros. Monoceros. Monoceros, which is one. Maybe a ceros is a horn, and a mono is one. The unicorn. Okay. But at any rate, that's where it shows it. That, that's where it is there in that uh, in the constellation in the big sky view. And this shows a close-up of where it is uh, using the pocket sky atlas. And um, of the 60 stars in this constellation, Monoceros, none shine brighter than magnitude 3.9. So fairly dim constellation. I'm not familiar with it. I mean, I've seen it in, in books, but I, I mean, as far as seeing it in the sky, I, I, I can't say I've seen it. Um, it's located roughly between, it, at the halfway point, the, the Rosette Nebula, that is, is located roughly at the halfway point between Procyon and Betelgeuse. And I believe we are. So oh yeah, okay. There's Procyon. Betelgeuse is off the off the chart here. Um, we can go up here and see it there. So roughly between Procyon, which is in Canis Minor, and Betelgeuse, which is the shoulder of Orion. Um, so at any rate, let's go back. Go back to this. Um, the nebula has several new general catalog designations. NGC 2237, NGC 2238, these are both star clusters, and NGT, NGT, NGC 2246, they're all parts of the nebulous region, while the one that we're looking at, which is NGC 2244, is the bright open cluster located within the nebula. Okay, and it's discovered piece by piece, all these nebula, and I just mentioned the NGCC numbers, or NGC numbers, um, they're discovered piece by piece. The English astronomer John Herschel found uh, 2244, and Albert Marth discovered 2238, and um, Lewis Swift was the first to observe 2237 and 2246. 
All of these cover four times as much of the sky as the moon, um, which would make it about two, uh, two degrees in, 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 in width. Um, they're about three times as far as, and three times the size of, three times as far away and three times the size of M42. Okay. So. Oh, I have another picture of it. There we go. I should have had this picture up when I was mentioning all those numbers. <laughs> would, have made it, would have made it a little more fun. <laughs> but, uh. You got to hear me rattle off a bunch of numbers. Uh, so, um, but this is the one we're looking for, NGC, N, yeah, NGC 2244. This is the Rosette Nebula here. Or actually the whole thing is the Rosette Nebula. Are all the yellows clusters? They're, they're open clusters. Open star clusters. Um, and this indicates a a nebula, like a, a, an emission nebula or a reflection nebula. This one, I believe, is the reflection nebula. I, no, no, I, I take it back. Emission nebula. I'm sorry, what, what was that? Oh, okay. 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 We'll, go, we'll go to this screen and let me stop sharing. Ready? So we can check in with the telescope again. So there's the uh, orientation of the telescope while it's imaging the Rosette Nebula at this time of uh, night, at this time of year. And we'll check in, oh, wrong button. We'll switch back to the ACP screen. The dew point is 21 degrees Fahrenheit and the temperature is 47 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So no worries on that. <laughs> Since this is a nice bright emission nebula, I'm doing a uh, 10 minute exposure, this time with the hydrogen alpha filter. I'm working on a project with this nebula right now, but when I do my images for my final image, I'm doing 20 minute exposures, but I figured that's probably a little too long for an online viewing session. So, so 10 minutes is the max I think we should do for exposures, but, but the, the camera can go much longer. So we still got a ways to go there. We'll check in on the uh, all sky camera. Mike Patton had his uh, house light on there earlier, very bright. You can still see the zodiacal light a bit. It hasn't quite even faded from view yet, but it's getting yeah. there. And you can see a little little light dome. There is some light pollution there, but this is a one minute exposure. And we take a one minute exposure like this every four minutes. And this is the uh, weather data from the observatory. So you can see the wind is uh, below the yellow line. So that means it's calm and not windy. And you can see the forecast is a little little rough here, but uh, overall it's uh, looking pretty good. But uh, the past two months have been a lot cloudier uh, than usual. But it's starting to get better. All right, so we got a ways to go. So we've got plenty of time uh, you know, for other questions or Has anybody seen, or just, 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 uh, just general, has anybody seen Venus in the morning? It, it's nice and bright. If you if you haven't seen it, you know when it clears up, see it. It's it, we've had a couple of clear nights and or clear mornings, um, and uh, it and the moon the moon was out too. It, it's just it's just a, a sight to behold. Venus. I looked at Venus. Sorry, go, go ahead. It was great on Friday morning. Venus was just barely above the horizon, and then it was a beautiful like crescent moon. Um, <clears throat> further up in the sky, it was really quite pretty. Yeah, um, and, and Venus right now is a crescent. Um, it was a very thin crescent last week. I looked at it again this week. It's it's getting thicker, uh, but pretty impressive to take a look at that. I can see it. I can see the crescent just looking at it through the binoculars, ten, a ten by fifty binoculars. That is.
I saw a very thin crescent moon this morning, but it was it got it got cloudy. It was it was kind of came like coming in and out of the clouds. We're a little more than halfway there. So somebody commented Mars. I haven't seen Mars. Uh, I know Mars is out there, but I haven't seen it. So that's good. By the way, for those of you that attended the uh, lecture series today, did you enjoy the story of how the, the bears got their long tails? <laughs> just, yeah. just a fair warning, KAS members have to put up with me all the time. You, you poor folks don't, so I'm sorry. It was fun. I it's loved wrong. it. <laughs> I like the short version. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how many people were uh, attending the lecture? Uh, a little over 400. Whoa. Pretty good. Yeah. Remember back in the day, uh, Don, when we'd go to those and it was like, well, there's a little room full. <laughs> right, you know, maybe 40, 50. Right, yeah. And I, and I should add, if any of you know the mythological story, you know, I told the clean version. So. <laughs> you told the clean version. The clean version, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, now I got to look up the other version. There you go. Hey, it's, pa it's past nine now. But hey, it's mythology. Well, it's the weekend. We, we could have young kids here. I don't, don't want right. to tell them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I'm here. I'm here, too. You know. If anyone's ever worked in a planetarium, especially back in the early 90s, um, I got I got the clean version from a show called Bear Tales that I run that I ran like I don't know 400 times. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I so I had that embedded in my soul forever. I heard I, I ran that show so many times. That, that's why I never wanted to work at a planetarium because you run the sh same shows over and over and over again. I think they're just misnamed bears. They're actually cats. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, they're pumped up squirrels. I was trained at uh, Abrams Planetarium in the uh, mid 90s, 80s. So Bob Victor and oh, Dave yeah. Batch and all those those guys and stuff like that. Yep. Did the training and such like that with me. So, did you run Bear Tales? No, we never did run Bear Tales. Usually, what we did is when it came down to that stuff, we were telling our own tales that uh, we would doing little research on and stuff like that right sometimes there are a few other main shows but we do have our own planetarium here in kalamazoo that's where i worked for nine years but when we as a club take a field trip to a planetarium we go to abrams because you know they they do a much better job plus the staff like, actually knows astronomy so you know we we stop at turkeyville because we want to get doped up on tryptophan first so we fall asleep during the show and then of course at Abrams, they do, you know, the, the can show and then they do, you know, a live sky tour. So they really give you your money's worth, even though it's just like a couple of dollars. But yeah, it, it was, it was, I went one time with the group and this club and it was it was a lot of fun. And we hope to do it again someday, especially because Abrams Planetarium was supposed to get a new meteorite exhibit. But that's probably been delayed because of, you know, what that thing I'm not going to we won't we won't talk. We don't know what you're talking about. We don't want to know. We are almost done, so let me switch back to ACP here. There we go. And we just a quick spoiler: we cannot fit the entire rosette, so we're going to look at like the very center of it, mainly the cluster, but some nebulosity too. So it looks really cool. This is one we can do with the Takahashi uh, as well, but we we did that uh, last year. So I try not to have the same thing over and over and over again. Did you do this one last? Did you say you did this one in December? We, we did the rosette with the Takahashi last, not, I, I guess, uh, last season, I should say. Not, last not 20, season? Okay, okay. Yeah, 2020, 2021 20, season. I don't remember gotcha. what month we did it. Yeah. It's 
We only do four of these. All right, there's a little preview of it, but we got to wait for the little bonk bonk. Bonk bonk. There we go. No bonks. Oh, so that's right. I have the sound turned off on the computer out there, so there's no bonks. Here we go. Are you ready? There we go. Whoa. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, so this is. It's dark in the middle. <laughs> the nebula surrounds. Uh, Nebula surrounds the cluster in, okay, the, so, so what we're looking at here is the clusters in the middle, right? Yeah. And the nebula surrounds that. Um, Frames it. Okay, with, and, and uh, the NGC 2244 contains 100, about 100 members and uh, formed within the past 5 million years. Um, and this cluster is 43 light years in diameter. Well, the nebula is 130 light years across. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, the estimated mass is about 10,000 solar masses. That's a lot of mass. Making it one of the more massive emission nebula known. Okay, on April 16th, 2019, the Oklahoma legislature passed HB, House Bill 1292, making the Rosette Nebula the official state astronomical object. <laughs> Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt signed it into law April 22nd, 2019. Michigan's, um, <laughs> you don't deserve it. No. Michigan's uh, Michi state Michigan. deep sky object is a cloud, an actual I, cloud. I was going to say that, you stole my joke. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But uh, ours is visible all winter, most of the winter at least. <laughs> The, they, the fact that you stole my joke is, is makes it even funnier, right? <laughs> it's too obvious, I guess. Somebody somebody thinks it's painful, though, according to the chat here. <laughs> and I believe North is to the bottom. Okay, I North think so, is to yes. the bottom. Look at, all yes, these nice, look at all these nice dark lanes you see. Like, if you go to the bottom here, in a, another place, you can see these really cool, dark. <laughs> those are probably dust lanes, are they not? This is like a pillar here. This is my favorite because it looks like a big fork or like a wrench. But it's a big giant pillar. Let's say like an you know an M16. There's a big pillars. Yeah. This yeah. is another pillar. That's in front of the rest of the nebula here. Oh yeah. Blocking the light. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's it's a bit. It's quite a bit brighter with a 20 minute exposure. But again, we we don't. You know, <laughs> that, that takes a long time. Right. Yeah. 20 minutes exactly. <laughs> to hey, get technical. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I don't know. We better check your math on some of this other <laughs> other stuff too. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of I'm starting to question uh, yeah, that's that's probably a good idea. We need we need a computer. <laughs> it's it's been a long day. We need a, a, a human computer like 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 they had back back in the day. Like Wilhelmina Fleming? Yes. <laughs> And normally this is kind of a, I mean, if, if you had, if you had a color picture, this would be red on the outside, kind of a reddish on the outside, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it looks, it looks good black and white too. I mean, man, use your flip phone. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Want to take any more gazes at the, the, you know, you can really, those dark nebula are just cool. Yeah. I like how clear those uh, dust lanes are. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Should we move on to the next topic? Absolutely. See if I can share my screen a little faster here. Yes. Okay. M78 is known as the other Orion Nebula. It's my name for it. Oh, that's your name for it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. But it's one of the big three in Orion, including M42 and M43, which we, we saw a lot earlier when we looked at Orion's sword. Um, it's also known as NGC 2068, but I'll refer to it as M78 or 
I'll just call it M78. It's easier. I get tied. My, I get tongue tied when I start saying NGC and all these numbers. Uh, it's discovered by Pierre Michane. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. In 1780, and in, he, he's the guy that helped uh, Charles Messier, and included by Charles Messier in his catalog that same year. Um, it's the only principal. Re let me let me go down here. That's where it is. It's the only principal reflection nebula in the Messier catalog. And that's, that's even closer there. So you can, this little squares, it just means it's a smaller, the bigger, the bigger nebula, nebulae have the shape, the basic, the, the you know, approximate shape of them. When they get to be a smaller size than this pocket sky atlas, they just put a square for things like that. But at any rate, um, it, 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 it's the nature of this, it's a, it's a reflection nebula and was discovered by Vesto Zliffer of Lowell Slifer. Slifer? Slifer, yes. Slifer of Lowell Observatory in 1919. And it's located two and a half degrees northeast of Zeta Orionis, that belt star here. And um, it includes uh, the companion nebula NGC 2064. Let's see if I have a closer up picture. Nope, that's all I got. NGC 2064, NGC 2067, and NGC 2071. They all shine by reflected light from hot young B-type stars. And the, the two stars, uh, which are known as really boring names here, HD 38563A and 38563B do not provide sufficient power in the in the ultraviolet to ionize the interstellar gas such that it glows um, or emits. So, oh, okay. So that is that evidence that it's a reflection nebula and not an emission nebula? Is that what, right. is that, what that statement means? Yeah, okay. it, it, it's basically a, it's definitely a reflection nebula. And the, th those two stars uh, aren't really close enough or powerful enough to excite the gas to make it glow like an emission nebula. Okay, so, so but they do, they are, th those stars are at least believed to be responsible for the reflection. Yes. Okay. I'm learning a lot tonight. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it looks like uh, the, well, I guess we'll get to that. We'll get to the rest of this a little later. And there's a question in the chat, what is Barnard's loop? It's basically most likely a another supernova remnant like the witch head. It's probably the witch head and Barnard's loop probably aren't related, but this is probably another supernova remnant like the witch head. And there's another, there's another, there is a supernova remnant um, called the rich witch's broom, or part of it is the witch's broom. And that's in, uh, that's in Cygnus, I believe, or around that area. Oh yeah, that's part of the Veil Nebula, yeah. Veil Nebula, yeah. Or Cygnus Loop, yeah. So, um, we'll check and see how we're doing. Yeah. Oh, I have it on the uh, All Sky chart there. So again, we're looking like up here somewhere. Oh, I gotta stop sharing. I can't see what you're doing when I do that. Oh. Okay, so, yeah, can you show that again? Oh, yeah, let me go back. So M78 is again right around okay. here somewhere. Right, right around here somewhere. Thanks. So we're kind of folk. We know we, we did the uh, the witch head over here, the bat, uh, of course, Orion, the horse head, and M78. So we're kind of working all around Orion tonight. There's a lot to see there. Uh, and one other question while we're on this picture. Isn't there something called the heavenly G? And I think we can see the whole thing. I think you could also call it a head, the hexagon. When, there's the winter hexagon. Winter yeah, hexagon. I, I think I, I think it's also you can also make a heavenly G out of it. <laughs> I don't I don't believe I've ever heard of that. So I, it's in it's in the. Uh, okay, well, I of course you it, would know that, but yeah, I I, I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I no. I believe it's re, it's referred to in the. Uh, um, oh, not the pocket sky. What's the book you and I both have? It's the handbook of. Not the handbook. Field Guide to the Stars and Planets. Oh, well, I guess and I guess I, if you look around, look, say, yeah, I think from Aldebaran and kind of loop around here around and go back up team. to here. Yeah, yeah, they maybe 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 Betelgeuse is the, okay. the uh, 
the end of that G, the, the, yeah. the inner end. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you can still I, see the zodiacal light. It just kind of hangs around forever. Yeah, that's just cool. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we're getting there. We still, we still got plenty of time. Let me show the okay. telescope. Oh, wrong button again. I keep opening the, the chat. So there's the scope. It hasn't moved too much compared to where it was before. But uh, we might make this our last look at the telescope tonight. Who knows? I don't think I will stay on and use the telescope after because with all, all of today's uh, fun, I'm, I'm quite uh, pooped. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can understand that. For those of you that attend the lecture series, right after, I took a little break, but then I went to start working on emails I got with all the wonderful, generous donations and sales of Miller Planispheres and comments, and 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 I just got done with that right before we started. So I am I, I am I am I am spent. <laughs> <laughs> I am tired of looking at a computer for one day, so I think I'll go watch TV. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably close somebody, my eyes and sleep. Somebody is asking what kind of camera the All Sky camera is. Oh, uh, we, we had that earlier. It's a S Big 340C. They don't actually make them anymore. We didn't mention this, but the the remote telescope was part of a our largest fundraiser we've ever done. Uh, Mike Patton, who I think is still with us, you know, he told us about that observatory he was going to build at Arizona Sky Village and said he'd give us room for a remote telescope. That was back in 2008, January of 2008. And then after like a year or two, we finally started doing a fundraiser and we raised over $120,000, mostly through member contributions. I believe that. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, if you're still on, Mike, thanks again. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, you guys are welcome. I've enjoyed, enjoyed it more than you guys have. <laughs> you're missing the winter, though. I don't know how you uh, stand that. So, I watch, Dustin, I watch it on TV. <laughs> That's probably the best. <laughs> Dustin asks, is there a schedule of when these viewings take place? Yes. Uh, let me go back. I'll go back to the tab here. I'll just bring up the website here. So you can go to activities. You can pull up online viewing sessions. And of course, we have lots of information here. These are actual pictures we took at uh, an online session. Some were informal, like the Lagoon Nebula, you can't really do till like uh, June. So that was like a special member one, but it still counts. <laughs> so of course, this is the one we're doing right now. And we have one left. We do four of these. We do one a month from November to February. And that seems to work out just fine. Some have talked about doing a March one, but we can really only do it in March when we do it early in the month because of daylight saving time. Because that goofs everything up. Yeah. Arizona is two hours behind us right now, but when we go to daylight time, then they're three hours behind. That just makes it much more complicated. And my folks live in, in Arizona and uh, I call them quite a bit and I got to keep remembering, okay, it's two hours now and later it's going to be three hours. And it's, it's, and I got to remember they're, they're eating dinner or, you know, <laughs> it's, it's Ooh, I hate daylight saving time. Yeah. I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of it. It, it, it yeah, but there's advantages and disadvantages, but I, I, def, I, I, I don't changing the clocks every day or I mean every twice a year is is a is a nuisance. Yes. I wonder I wonder how much I wonder how much he, how many millions of dollars get lost when we change the clocks. It just it much, can't be good. You're I much more likely to have a heart attack when we change the clocks, even when we fall back. Oh. You're much more likely to have a heart attack. I just don't like it. Like, I'm not tired at the right time. I'm not hungry at yeah. the right time. The cats aren't hungry at the right time. Oh, it messes <laughs> up your cats, too. That's yeah. even worse. They're, There's, like, waking well, me up an hour farmers. early, and I'm like, no, you don't That's understand. Memo. The time changed. <laughs> well, think of farmers. I mean, you know, the dairy farmers. They, the cows don't don't care what, what time it is. <laughs> Richard, you might want to look at the uh, chat. There's a few 
questions you might want to answer? Uh, well, we, we talked about the the dome camera and the. I think I got all the most recent ones. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. My bad. Well, if I miss you in the chat, you know, don't be shy. You can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, what kind of setup does the computer uh, use to run everything? It's It has uh, 32 gigs of memory, which makes me mad because I told the person that bought the computer to get 64 gigs so he could use it well into the future, but he didn't listen to me. Uh, the CPU, I, gosh, I forget exactly. I could bring that up on the computer out there, but. Uh, the hard drive, it's like a two terabyte hard drive, but we really don't use it that much because all the images automatically go up to our Google Drive account. So they go up to the cloud and we have a two terabyte uh, cloud account because we we started with a 200 gigabyte one and we filled that up pretty quick. <laughs> Richard, is, is that computer upgradable? I mean, can we put uh, more? We probably could, yeah. We um, we most certainly could put in more RAM. I think it can hold up to 64 gigs, but I'm not 100% sure. I think that's true. But it's been a while. You know, for the most part, it runs okay. We might get another computer out there because I think I have a, a old desktop I can get my hands on to run the um, the all sky camera and the Piishi cam that shows the live view of the telescope. If we take those those off, that'll that'll help the other computer a bit. Oh, we're done. Yay. You can quit guiding now. I don't know why it's kind of lingering out there. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> oh, let me turn the sound on so we can hear the gonks. There we go. Did you guys hear that? We heard uh -huh. it. All right. Well, <laughs> that, that means it's done. Is that the first time we've heard that tonight? Yeah, I, I had the sound turned off, so we didn't I, hear it. I, I, I looked at the YouTube video of the last session, so I, I remember hearing it uh, sometime. I never remember hearing it then, but uh, yeah. wow, that's, that's beautiful. This is pretty. And again, this is the first time we, we're, we're, we're doing this here tonight. This, this this particular nebula. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We, no, no, we, go ahead. We may have done it during a bonus session, but I don't remember. Now, do you see <laughs> do you see the two stars that I mentioned before? Are those um those like, two stars? That, you know, it's kind of like this one and this one. I don't, I don't okay. think it's the two close together. Okay. Well, All right. Okay. But anyway, well. um small even a small telescope you can see those two illuminating stars which which appear like a double nucleus in the compact coma oh it's like a, i guess this is looking like a comet i'm not sure maybe that maybe that yeah i'm not sure <laughs> well, it's, an, it's, an m object. it's an m object so when you see it with uh, visually it maybe it does look like a comet um with the comet head um a, a double nucleus looking like a comet, comet head or something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this means. <laughs> but the, the nebula fans out to the southwest and suggests a faint comet tail. Oh, you know what? And maybe we're looking at this in the on the to the lower left, and then the, the tails out to the upper right. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's what we're looking at. Um, okay. But at any rate, um, it's part of the larger Orion Nebula complex, which we were talking about. Uh, with the M42 and M43, of course, being the most prominent object. This, this one, which is M78, hosts a large number of very young stars, less than a million years old. Another one of those star nurseries, uh, most of which have not reached the main sequence yet. It includes 45, uh, approximately 45 of those variable T Tauri stars that we mentioned earlier. Um, there's 17 Herbig Haro objects. Jets of which are jets of matter ejected from young stars, um, or, or I should say, seventeen of those objects are known. 
can we see those or is that you need something else to see you need, you need a bigger telescope much bigger okay all right <laughs> <laughs> well then forget it um, in 1991, uh, infrared observations with the uh, 1.3 meter Kitt Peak Telescope, that's in Arizona, it's also in Arizona, discovered four star clusters totally hidden in visual light by dark absorbing clouds. So where would those, are those be the um, dark absorbing clouds? Would those be the, these, this dark, these dark lanes we're seeing here? Yeah. Okay, so, so those are hiding um, those, those four star clusters. Uh, hiding them in visual light, not hiding them in infrared light, though. Wow, that's pretty cool. I don't, I can't say I've seen this one uh, with, with just with the telescope. M78? one around here, yeah. Any other comments? I was going to say, as far as it looking like a comet, isn't that kind of the commonality of all the Messier objects is that Messier was like, is that a comet? Nope, it's not. I'm going to put it in my catalog so I remember that it's not a comet. <laughs> yeah, it's a point well taken. <laughs> There's one called the false comet in the tail of Scorpius. Uh, I don't remember if that's a Messier object or not. Yeah, there are some Messier objects where Messier knew they weren't comets like the Pleiades, you know, because that was known for a long yeah. time. But eventually he just started adding objects to the catalog to pad it a little bit. He did discover four comets. He did. But that's not what we remember him for. No. <laughs> trying to answer the question uh i don't see if i see that on the notes as far as how big this object is or what's the diameter of the uh um what's the diameter of this image i did not uh calculate the diameter of the nebula based on its angular diameter and distance i didn't i didn't do that sorry okay. <laughs> it's just a little trigonometry though it's not too bad it's pretty yeah it, it's a homework question yeah there you go extra credit I had a, I had a uh, chemistry uh, professor who you'd ask him a question about, you know, something and he, he, didn't, the, uh, he, didn't, he didn't know the answer. He'd say, well, you tell me. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, the angular diameter is about, uh, um, oh, here I can, uh, we don't usually like to show this cause it, you know, cause it's going to be in pretty color. Well, it's kind of off, but uh I guess it doesn't say, but the, the field of view is, you know, um, over half a degree uh, square, you know, over nearly 37 arc minutes uh, square. So it's, you know, little over half a degree is the field of view shown here. Okay. Similar to the moon, moon's diameter. Yeah. But we'll bring it up there one more time. All right, Joe, you want to wrap us up and sure. Um, well, thank you everyone um, for, for coming. Uh, there are a few closing slides. Don't, don't, don't forget those, oh, the closing oh, slides. Okay. So I, I'm glad you're here to tell me these things. Remember he's new. He's new folks. <laughs> Got to cut him some slack. And I just sent him the stuff like yesterday. So he didn't have a lot of time to look at it. Excuses, excuses. Okay. Um, okay. Yep, there we go. Okay. Join the KAS and learn to use the remote telescope. Uh, you, you can, Learn to use it and and do this on your own if you like. Um, lots a, a lot lots of us have done that, and uh, I think uh, these show the counties of the remote telescope. If you're if you're if you're a member and you're in these counties, you can sign up and, and use the remote telescope. So yeah, um, what else do we got here? The next online viewing session, we already talked about this, but we'll bring it up again. Uh, February 26th, it'll be a Saturday. And if that doesn't, at nine o'clock p.m. And if that doesn't work, uh, then the next day, Sunday, February 27th, will be the next one. Oh, I was just want to ask a question. <clears throat> um, if there are certain research projects 
I think we have said we might do uh, exception to that. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, the nearby universities, like say you know MSU or U of M, you know, or, or even some of the smaller places. Uh, if they're in, interested in using the scope for research, they just have to send us a short proposal. Okay, and uh, one other thing here. Um, the, what am I doing here? Okay, email list. Sign up to receive reminders about this. Okay, if, if, you, if you get on the email list, you'll get reminders about the sessions, which will include registration and YouTube links. Um, once you register, you'll get, you'll get the link. Uh, links to download uh, the session images and notification of a postponement or cancel cancellation. Cancel is, I was going <laughs> to, talking too much here. Um, but use the website. The website is excellent. Um, and let me get, I got this thing is in my way again. There we go. Okay, that's the website, kasonline.org. Um, well, no, this is not the website. This is the email address. Yep, but you start, right. use the website contact form or email at this address. The kasonline.org is also the, um, the website. So hopefully that makes sense. And just a reminder, uh, next week, February, Friday, February 4th, so in six days, we're going to see uh, this um, Dr. J. Pasikoff is uh, going to talk about recent and future solar eclipses. He's been to scores of eclipses, scores of solar eclipses. Not all of them total, but many of them total. <laughs> and he's definitely been to more solar eclipses than I have <laughs> Success successfully. <laughs> maybe all of us put together. Yeah, maybe. That's right. So um, you can download tonight's images at this address right here. And if you're on the email address or email list, that'll, it'll, it'll, that'll kick in. Isn't that right? I think I just said yep. that. Okay. I will have, yeah, give me a little time to get the images processed. It might not be tomorrow, but uh, no later than Monday, probably around the afternoon if, at, at latest. So I'm only human, folks. Come on. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> He's not Vulcan like I am, but well, we'll give him a break. Okay. But anyway, thank you very much for joining. And um, I'm going to get rid of this. Stop sharing it. <laughs> okay. There we go. Now I can see people. Thank you very much for joining. It was my pleasure to uh, talk you through this. And uh, thank you for listening and, uh, and joining in. I hope it was uh, hope it was a I hope it was a good uh, a good time. <laughs>